Hello class, this is section 2.5 and in this video we are going to talk about the problem of determining the steady state temperatures on a 2D surface. Let's make it simple and just uh, consider a rectangle. So we have this here rectangle with height h and length l. Since we are concerned with two-dimensional steady state temperatures, we have to use the Laplace equation, written as so. And we have these four boundary conditions. These tell us what the temperature is on the four sides of the rectangle. So it turns out that solving the Laplace equation with these boundary conditions is going to be really difficult. So we're going to divide our problem here into four different problems with simpler boundary conditions. So we have here four different sets of boundary conditions and when you add the four together you get the boundary condition we started out with. So in fact we have u equals u1 plus u2 plus u3 plus u4 and since the Laplace equation is a linear homogeneous equation we can just add four solutions to it and it will still be a solution and it will be a solution with the correct boundary conditions and this is how we simplify the problem by dividing it into four. For this video we are just going to concentrate on the first of these sets um, the one with u1 non-negative and the rest zero the other three can be handled similarly and I think at least one of them is going to be a homework problem and one of them will do a little bit of in class but let's concentrate on just the first example. So let's rewrite our problem as one where we have a Laplace equation with a boundary condition, but the boundary condition in which three of the four sides are set to zero. So we begin, as we always do, by finding the product solutions u x y equals f x g y. So again, um, not all the solutions of this equation will be a product solution, but this gives us a place to start. By plugging this fxgy in the Laplace equation, we get that gy times the second derivative of x plus fx times the second derivative of y is equal to zero and we can move this term to the right hand side and shifting all the x terms to the left and the y terms to the right we then obtain 1 over fx times second derivative equals minus 1 over gy times the second derivative of g So again, because the left-hand side is just a function of x and the right-hand side is just a function of y, they must in fact both be constant. It turns out that the minus lambda choice is the more convenient one here. It's going to de depend um, on the boundary conditions you pick. The main point is that we want our eigenvalue problem to have f double prime plus lambda f, and that's why we picked the minus lambda here. So let's look, look at the eigenvalue problem. And this one is going to be 1 over fx times second derivative equals minus lambda. Or we can rewrite it as the very familiar f double prime x plus lambda fx equals 0. Let's figure out what our boundary conditions are. So we need to write down u 0y is 0 and u ly is 0 and this becomes fx gy sorry f0 gy equals 0 fl gy equals 0 so this suggests strongly that f naught is 0 and fl is 0. Otherwise, um, gy is 0 identically, and that will 
mean that our solution u is just zero everywhere, which is silly, a silly, a trivial solution. So we have this equation with these boundary conditions. And it turns out that this eigenvalue problem, if you solve it, will have the solution. Lambda equals n pi over L squared as the eigenvalues for n larger than 1. Or rather, let's write down n as 1, 2, 3, and so on, with eigenfunctions sine n pi over L x. So let's look at our equation for g. We have one minus 1 over g equals second derivative of g equals minus lambda. We have to use our second initial condition. So we have here that f x g h equals 0. So either g h is 0 or f x must be 0 everywhere. But if f x is 0 everywhere, then u is 0 everywhere. So that's the trivial solution again. So we instead consider the initial condition g of h equals 0. Let's rewrite our equation as g double prime equals lambda g. And I'm going to leave this either an in-class problem or a homework problem. But we go, we're going to obtain g of y is equal to c times sinh of um, y minus h. Here, um, sinh of theta, as a reminder, is just going to be e e theta minus e minus theta over 2. And it's pretty straightforward to verify that it satisfies both the equation g double prime equals lambda g and the initial condition g of h equals 0. Whoops, I forgot to add a square root lambda term over here. And of course, lambda is just going to be sinh n pi over l y minus h, since the lambda was n pi over l squared. Here, n is going from 1, 2, 3, and so on. The astute student might ask how we knew that f was an eigenvalue problem and g was a separable equations problem. So here's the way you figure it out. The eigenvalue problem needs two boundary conditions to be set to zero, whereas the separable equation problem needs only one boundary condition to be set to zero. As you may remember, here are our boundary conditions. And we know that the y boundary condition, um, the only one we have is u, u of h equals zero. That's set to zero. So there's only one y boundary condition set to zero, whereas there are two x boundary conditions set to zero, which are u0 y equals 0 and u l y equals 0. And that's kind of how we knew that f of x needed to be an eigenvalue problem, when g of y needed to be a separable equations problem. But then we know that product solutions must be of the form sine n pi l over x, which is our f x, times sinh n pi over l y minus h, which is our g y. We set c equals 1 for convenience, and this is for n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And therefore, our solution must be of this form. u x y equals the infinite sum of a n sine n pi l of x times sinh n pi l y minus h, going from 1 to infinity. I want to emphasize that this is a solution for this boundary condition, the one where you have three of the boundary values set to zero. To get the solution to our original problem, we need to do this problem four times with the four different boundary conditions here, here, and here, and add them all together. But let's figure out how to write down a n. It turns out that the usual Fourier series trick works, and we get, since u x naught equals f one x, the one boundary condition that wasn't set to zero. Therefore, we get this expression for the constant a n. The only difference from the regular Fourier coefficient calculation is that we have to worry about this extra sinh term, but that isn't too difficult. So again, this problem is going to be long, but the steps are not that too different from the techniques we used to solve the heat equation in previous chapters.